but I just haven't figured out how to copy and paste that to my PowerPoint. So there's going to be a point in time where I just show you guys the diagrams at the fronts and I'll talk as I would, you know, the information that was on the PowerPoint. But if at any point in time or, or after the uh, presentation, if you guys would like my PowerPoint, I'd be more than happy to send it to you. Uh, and I'll uh, put my email and Twitter information and Facebook information at the end of the, uh, the slide and I'll tell you guys at the end. So uh, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Let's get this out of here. That's the diagrams. I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, let's go to presentation. Everything's been working a little slow for me on Zoom today too, so I don't know what's going on, so just please bear with me. All right, a system to create multiple fronts from your base 4-4. So, uh, here we go again, man, with this damn thing. Hang on one second, guys. I think my thing froze. There we go. All right. Everyone can see. First off, I want to shout out to this guy, uh, Coach Bill Johnson, a.k.a. The Moose, they call him. Uh, he's got a Facebook page. Shut him, shut him down. Shut him out. Shut him up. He's also on Twitter, at Coach J1957. So Coach Johnson was my high school football coach, my senior year of high school. And I coached with him for a couple of years as his offensive coordinator at Passaic Valley High School up in New Jersey. So Coach Johnson is a defensive wizard up in our area. He coached at Montclair State University for a very long time. Before that, Georgia Tech. And, you know, I, I learned a lot of defense from really two people, one being Coach Johnson. And the basis of the, the, the terminology that I'm going to introduce you tonight is, comes from Coach. So he's got a ton of information. He's like a pool of knowledge. If you want to give him a follow or a shout out on his Facebook page, it's right there. And also on Twitter too. Just tell him uh, Rudy Simonetti sent you. And, um, you know, he'll, he'll give you whatever you need. I know he's been posting a lot of bear fronts lately. And, uh, you know, he does a lot of things with coverages, obviously, and, and linebacker stuff. But again, I just, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, if I talked about all this stuff and not mention him as the motivation for how I do my defensive system. You said over high school. Okay, and uh, uh, my one year being a defensive coordinator was in 2018 at Dover High School, um, and we we implemented a lot of stuff that I learned from Coach. Uh, I had a lot of other influences as well. My other high school coach, Coach Chet Parlavecchio, you know, really did a, um, a tremendous a tremendous defensive coordinator he was too. He ran a four three system. Um, he did a lot of stunting out of the four three. And that, you know, kind of motivated me to kind of instill that into our 4-4 four, four system, too, which helps you create multiple fronts. And, you know, Coach really was a, an artist when it came to technique and fundamentals at linebackers. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys obviously know of Joe Dan, football uh, coach from Virginia. You know, I want to give a shout-out to him. I, I read a ton of his stuff. I think he's tremendous. And um, you'll see a lot of his work, too, a little bit within the system, too. I kind of molded a lot of things from a lot of different people. Um, you know, the, the point I want to make clear is, you know, I'm no genius. I don't think anybody is. And in fact, my high school coach, Coach Pravecchio, once told me, you know, anyone who thinks that they're an innovator at this level is a fool. And he's correct because football is football. It doesn't change. It, you know, everyone gets something from somewhere and it, it just kind of evolves a little bit. Everyone researches various systems of the offense or defense and they mold it into their own. But, you know, I just, I just want to point that out, like, all the concepts here tonight, it's nothing new. I just want to provide you guys with a simple, organized, you know, consistent system that helps your high school athletes defensively compete and shut teams down. And, and that's the 4 4 that I'm going to present to you guys tonight. Uh, let me see if I can move forward here. Here we go. So, my base philosophy when it comes to not just defense, even offense, is the scheme serves the players. And here's my philosophy. This is why I found out I've been coaching uh, high school football for 15 years. I love the kids, but as the years go on, their football knowledge decreases. That's what I found out these past 15 years. It just keeps going down and down and down. So I'm into systems, whether it's defensively or offensively, that kiss. Keep it simple and stupid. Keep things simple and consistent. Minimal thinking, especially on defense, equals more aggression. Okay. I focus, you know, my philosophy when it comes to defense is being physical, number one. We want to put speed out there, and we want to be relentless. If you're relentless, that means you're going to pursue the football and tackle somebody. 
I, I like to be multiple and flexible. I'm the same way on offense. I feel I should be the same way on defense. You know, it, it's great to show teams different looks. I feel as though, you know, when you show multiple fronts or when you stem or you stunt or you blitz, it gives high school offensive linemen fits. How do I know? I was a center my entire career. I did not like that stuff, okay? Especially odd fronts when you get a nose guard in front of you. And odd fronts, I mean, that means you're definitely going to stun and blitz. You don't say static in an odd front. It's constantly fluid. So that, that's a system that, you know, I, my philosophy is, is, is serving the players, so to speak. I want to be multiple and flexible. I want to be gap and fundamentally sound, disciplined above all else, okay? Defense to me is all about, obviously, um, reaction. And, and, you know, I believe that you coached as a defensive coordinator. You coached the game Saturday to Thursday. And then Friday night is all about you making adjustments. Everyone should know their job, what to do. But it's all about fundamentals and technique on defense. For high school kids, I believe in being one gap defense at all times. Now, there are moments in this presentation when we go to an odd front where at times I will ask my nose guard just bull rush to center and kind of play that two-gap role, but that's about it. Usually when we're in out front, we're slant or stunt or something, and everyone has a gap. The minute in high school football on defense, I found out when you're playing uh, one gap, one moment, and then two gap, the other moment, another moment, you're setting yourself up for disaster. You got to pick one or the other. And honestly, two gap, and it's a bitch to teach, part of my uh, French, but when it comes to high school players, man, it is a lot to teach. Just keep it simple. Just have the kids – we're in a gap. That's why I believe in the one gap defense. I'm a big fan at the high school level because, you know, uh, we played in the Heaven Open Conference. Coach Quill, I'll tell you where we were a running minded football conference. Everyone ran the football. So we want to build from the inside out. NFL today is just the opposite. They build from the outside in because it's a passing league. Um, and that kind of ties to my last bullet. So that's, that's my philosophy on defense. And when I took my philosophy, made a little chart, and I matched it up to, because I either played under or coached under the 4-4 just about my entire, you know, career. Uh, the only other defense, the 4-3-2 I, I played under, but that was eons ago, and it's pretty similar to the 4-4. The only other defense I, I have experience in uh, being coached uh, when I coached at uh, Elmwood Park Mount all was the 5-2. And uh, one of the fronts I have in here, and the other front, I'm sure you all know about it, is kind of, to me, that 5-2 defense is just one gap. But when I took my philosophy here and, and I kind of matched up to the 4-4, I found the 4-4 to be very similar to my philosophy. So if I got to take a defense and install it in a week to the kids and teach my coaches, I'm choosing the 4-4 because it's simple, it's sound, and it's safe. And that's usually effective, right? It all goes back to my KISS philosophy. It's an eight-man front. And it's one gap because it's an eight-man front. And that plays down, you know, to the league we played in in Henelope and every team ran the football. Uh, we saw, what, like three or four wing T teams? Uh, you know, I mean, Coach, you guys at Tech were running the football first, whether it be option or some wing T elements in there too. The only true spread team we saw was Smyrna. And later on when Milford came into our conference, Milford. So, you know, uh, there's ways out of this eight-man front to, you know, when you're playing a Sussex Tech or Sussex Central one week, you know, and you got to prepare to stop the wing tee and all that stuff first. The next week you're playing Smyrna or Milford, you can drop back into your 3-3 three, three stack and move your outside linebacker back and pay, play a seven-man front, essentially, with a two-deep safety. You know, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's all very multiple and flexible. It's one gap. Um, like I said before, multiple flexibility. We have elements of the 4-3 defense in here, and that's all based upon speed. And I'm going to go over my – my personnel designations a little bit about how we place people on, uh, you know, where I like to place people in the 4-4 defense. Um, like I said before, this can easily become a 4-2-5 or even a 6-2 front. We've played both before. It can easily get to odd fronts. And, you know, you can do a 5-3, a 3-3, a 3-4, an eagle, a bear front. You know, uh, we, we start to, to kind of, delve into doing more 5-3 stuff uh, last year and year before, and then thus 3-3 stack stuff when uh, we saw spread teams. Um, you know, the point I want to make with all this stuff here, usually when a team is multiple on defense, you know, it looks like to your opponent that you're just the flavor of the week. You know what I'm saying? Um, that you're just throwing a ton of different defenses out there based off of your opponent that week that you don't really know what you're doing. The thing about this is 
the underlying principles of this system and scheme, they do not change. Okay? We're always one gapped, shaded. The reads don't change. Most importantly, the run fits don't change, which I'll show you in a minute. And that's the keys of it. From as long as those stay in, in place, you can run really any front or stunt. I mean, the possibilities are endless. And that's why I really favor this system. Just real quick, I want to go over my technique. So I know this might differ, and this is just the way I was taught. So some people call the one technique the shade of the center. I call them the shade. I call my one technique the inside of the guards. I know some people call them the two eye, but there's a reason why too when it comes to this system that we run. Um, why I call it the inside shade of the guard one technique, you'll find out in a minute. But uh, I do know it's also a two eye, obviously. But I just want to make that clear that when I call like a 31 front or a 13 front in a little bit, you'll understand you know where I'm coming from. Okay. Other than that, everything else is the same. Head up, you're you're even two, four, six. Okay, outside of the guard is threes. Um, outside of the tackles is five. Uh, we will line up in a four-eye technique, which is inside the tackle. And then we have head up on a tight end six, inside tight end seven, and outside is nine. And our gaps, obviously, are, are the same as always. So like I just said before, uh, this is a multiple flexible system. The underlying principles, like I told you, we're one-gapped. Um, our reads and our run fits don't change, okay? therefore. It looked to our opponent, it looks like we're running a thousand different defenses, but in actuality, we're not. We're just throwing different fronts at you. Our run fits don't change ever. Okay. Um, so before I talk about system and all that, I think it's very important that we talk about personnel because that to me tells you how you're going to be multiple, so to speak. Okay. Because then you start moving people around a little bit and you get real aggressive and fancy and all that stuff. So I have some universal personnel requirements. First off, when it comes, we're going to have our best athletes on the entire team out on defense. Our, our best 11 will play. And we're going to focus on speed. We're going to focus on being relentless and aggressive, which equals toughness. And we want good, short tackles. I'm not saying everyone's got to be a bruiser and knock someone's head off. That'd be great. But, you know, we just want good, sound, short tackles. Okay? I think if you have these three elements here, you're off to a great, great start when it comes to uh, team defense. This is how I base off my terminology, just so when I talk about personnel, you guys know what I'm talking about. So um, I kind of divide our, our terminology to the strong side and the weak side of, of uh, offensive formation. So to the strong side, we'll have our defensive tackle, our defensive end to the strong side will be called our strike. We have our bandit outside linebacker or strong safety, a.k.a. a hybrid player, to the strong side. And we'll call our strong side cornerback the hit cornerback. Our free safety, you know, is our center fielder. He could be to both sides. More times than not, will be to the strong side. But I put him under both. Weak side, we have our nose tackle. Our weak defensive end, we just call him our defensive end. Our weak side inside linebacker is the will, hence the W. Our rover is our outside linebacker and, and safety hybrid player. We have our weak corner, whoops, and our free safety again, like I said. So talking about personnel, <clears throat> this is important. You know, obviously, you know, you got to fit the correct – you don't want to fit square pegs around holes, is what I'm trying to say. So when it comes to our defensive tackle, what I look for – your best and strongest D lineman. He could end up being his, your best fo overall football player too. Why do you want him to be your best and strongest D lineman? He's the three technique more times than not, and he's going to face a lot of double teams because he's always the strong side. He cannot get pushed back. So we want this guy to be your best and strongest D lineman. Now he could be six four, three fifty. That's great. You know he could be a little smaller. That that's fine too. But if he's your best lineman, put him there. Size is just a bonus. Obviously, you know, what I look for overall, too, when it comes to the linemen, I mean, if you're quick off the ball, that's a start. Our strike defensive end, just said it, he's quick and powerful. Most importantly, he's disciplined. He must set the edge. More times than not, he's going to get that, that tight end or that tackle blocking down on him, and he's got to be able to be disciplined and not run up the field and close down with that tackle and spill the, uh, the kick out or, or the fullback kick out or, or the trap. So he's got to be extremely disciplined. 
and he can't lose contain. I think we got a question. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Our Mike linebacker, out of the two between him and the Will, he's the bigger and more powerful of the two, and he's the more short that. Okay. Um, we usually have him, you know, calling in our plays defensively. It doesn't have to be him. It could be the Will. I've had that in years past, too, even when, you know, I wasn't the coordinator, but I worked for, like, Coach Johnson. You know, I believe one year we had the Will call of uh, the defense. He was just smarter than the two. That's fine. Our bandit linebacker. So this has evolved a little bit. Uh, back when I played in this system, your bandit linebacker, Coach always put him – <clears throat> excuse me, or made him probably your best defensive player. Today, more so than not, based off of, you know, you're seeing wing tee one week, but then spread the next week. To me, he's got to be a short tackler above all else. He's got to be aggressive. A good athlete, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't have to be your best athlete. But he's got to be just a good athlete, good enough to be able to maybe drop back in the coverage. Okay, or cover someone man to man, or just be an aggressive outside linebacker and tackle somebody. He's a hybrid player. I think your best athlete on the field should be that free safety. I'm not saying he's got to be your best football player. That could be the D tackle, the Mike linebacker, or even the strike defensive end. I don't know. But your best athlete, or the best of the DBs, should be that free safety because um, he's got a whole bunch of stuff he's got to do. He's aggressive because he runs the alley. And he got to play center field. He's got to have good range and be able to, you know, maybe go up and get a football and make picks. <clears throat> so to me, he's got to be able to recognize stuff too and have good play recognition and just be a good athlete and play center field like a center fielder would in baseball. Our hit cornerback, um, obviously when it comes to both quarterbacks, cornerbacks, he wants speed first. He's the better of the two cornerbacks and both. I'll just get the weak cornerback out of the way too. This is important with me is I discipline. And I know I'm not giving, you know, a clinic tonight on coverages, but, you know, more times than not, especially, you know, these past couple of years, I found our, our cornerbacks to be a little bit lacking in the eye discipline department. We got better as my tenure at Dover went on with that. But, um, you know, it's just, especially high school kids, man, they kind of lose focus a little bit, uh, what I've noticed anyway. And it's, we really harp on that eye discipline stuff in practice. I think that's most important because that makes up for, for really a lack of speed a little bit, you know, if, if the guy across from you is better than you. Uh, the weak side personnel, so the nose tackle, man, you can use – he's got to be strong and quick. I, I like using those wrestler-type kids. You know, maybe, like I said, the kids that aren't 6'4", 350, <clears throat> but the ones that, you know, maybe are like uh, 195, 5'10", 195, but just quick off the ball, man, and he's a wrestler-type kid. You know, maybe use an ex-linebacker over here. And, you know, I'm going to go to my DN here. I'm going to tell you, he's probably – he's an athletic kid, ex-linebacker. We, we favor speed over size, and he's a better pass rusher than he would be a, a run stopper. But he also has to be disciplined. Bottom line is this is where you can kind of mold 4-4 uh, four, four personnel and 4-3 personnel. Your defensive ends and your nose tackle could be ex-linebackers, really, you know. You put a focus on speed there. Really, the only true uh, D lineman that you have is that three technique. Okay, he's got to be that old school, that D tackle in this case. He's going to be an old school lineman where he can't get pushed back. He's got to be a hop and hold his ground. So that's kind of where, you know, uh, personnel requirements between the 4-4 four, four and 4-3 four, kind of are the same. <clears throat> Will linebacker, um, he's actually got more speed than, than the Mike would. And, you know, if we move him, we want to make him a little bit of pass rusher at times. We have done in the past uh, at Dover. Our Rover linebacker is really more of a hybrid than the Bandit is. Uh, we always had at Dover our Rover linebacker drop back to safety when we did our 4-2-5 front or our 3-3 three, three stack or our 3-4. Um, he's more of a DB type, like I said, and he's, he's a little lighter in the band. I had a kid three years ago, Ray Sean Alexander was his name. He was a wrestler, actually. A uh, buck fifty-five, about five ten, tough as nails though, and he got the job done all year long over there. I never lost my faith in him. We he couldn't cover worth of anything. He thought it was a safety, um, but you know the only thing we ever asked him to do was cover the weak side flats, and, and just you know play cut back or fold, and um, you know just be tough in pursuit of the football, and he did that. Coach, and okay. I just want to say – So I that's personnel. Okay, can, can you hear me, Coach? Go ahead, Coach, just, absolutely. Before, before you move on, I just want to say, you know, I think that's so important to define, especially in high school, to define your 
what type of kid you're looking at at each position. Because I think at the end of the day in high school football, like you said, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. If you put the right kids in the right positions, I think that's ultimately the biggest thing. So I love that you you kind of described each um, each personnel trait <clears throat> that you'd like to see in each position. So excellent job, Coach. Absolutely. And, you know, this allows me to kind of dictate what, what fronts to run that year. Because, you know, I mean, if you have certain players that are out of place, man, you can't run certain fronts, you know. You just set yourself up for a disaster. So it all goes hand in hand. Um, you know, lost my train of thought there for a second. I did want to say something. I forgot, but it'll probably come back to me later. Um, it's just so important, personnel, man. Like I said, it goes on offense. It works the same way on offense, man. You're not going to put um, a slow quarterback at the high school level in the spread formations, you know, because you're not throwing the football a lot. You're running the football to me anyway, you know. Um, you're going to get him under center handing the ball off a lot and throwing play action passes. That's just me. Works the same thing on defense. <clears throat> so that's our personnel for defense. Um, I want to talk about our communication, setting the strength. So this is simple and concise. And, and you know, I'm all about that. Keep it simple, stupid. And we want to keep things – also, when it comes to our terminology, and I'll make mention of this, you know, we want to keep things simple, concise, and relatable to the kids, Okay. I don't like long sentences of how to call defense. Same thing goes on offense. I, I just like, you know, we try to limit our calls to very few words. And um, when we, this is going to be important too, setting the strength. Um, so the reason I talked about personnel, when we set the strength, all these guys here on the strong side, if I say tight, they're all going to line up to the tight end side, okay? And the weak side is going to line up opposite of it. If I say field, these strong side guys are all going to line up to the field if the ball's on the hash. Bench, that means they're going to line to the boundary, B for boundary. So the strong side person now would line up to the hash. If there's no tight end and the ball's in the middle of the field, I'll give it a right or left call. That means our strong side, if I call right, our strong side personnel will line up to the right. Our weak side personnel will line up opposite. Okay? Same thing, vice versa, to the left. By setting the strength call allows us to set the front call. That kind of, like, you'll see in a little bit when I call certain fronts, our personnel strength will at times be set up to the front's weakness, thus covering your front weakness. Okay? Does that make sense? I'll explain that in a minute. That after we set the strength call, we then set the front. We do it two ways, through numbers and through words. First, before I get into that, I talked to you about um, before that the underlying principles of this system does not change. This is where, you know, this concept here, and we all, I mean, I knew my run fits when I first started coaching. Everyone does it. But the concept of the umbrella came to me from Joe Danny. And, you know, he called it the umbrella, but he got it from somewhere else, too, and I forget what else he called it. But it's, it's genius. And, you know, we do a drill that he does just like this, just so the kids understand the run fits and they're consistent. But this is the umbrella principle. Anything under this little umbrella here, this little half circle, uh, I did that again, I hate doing that. These guys here, your four line, your two inside linebackers are the spill players. Your bandit and your rover are either primary force if the ball is to them or cutback if the ball is away from them. Some people call them the full players too. I call the cutback. Your free safety is always running in the alley. In your corner to the strong side, like the ball's coming here to, to the right. Your hit corner plays it outside in. Your weak side corner plays the last man. If the ball's coming this way, it's the opposite. Your weak side corner plays outside in. Your hit corner plays last man. Free safety's alley no matter what, okay? If I decide to call a 3-3-5, three, three, we call our stack front, I'll take the strike linebacker and move him back to middle linebacker. The entire line flips over, and now we have a 3-3 three, three stack front. But if you notice, nothing changes within the umbrella. I just took a spill player, put him at the linebacker, quote-unquote, and all these guys are made the same. So our spill players will always be spill players. Our 
primary force and cutback players will always play primary force or cutback. Our free safety will always play the alley. Our hitting corners will always play outside in or last man. The ball's away from him. If we drop this rover back to safety, he's still playing cutback, balls away. If the ball's coming towards him, he's got to come up and be the primary run force player. Okay? If we go to the under front, we'll put the bandit on the line. All right, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And he'll still be the primary force player to his side. The ball comes to his side. That does make you nervous because he is closer and tighter to the football. And this is why we put a premium on speed. This is kind of why this bandit here is a hybrid player. And we kind of put a running back here because, you know, from the under front look, if this dude runs a toss, he's, this bandit has to be able to chase this running back down, not with him outside. Okay. And to me, that's a bit of a, one weakness of the under front, which I love that front, by the way, is just having this bandit down here as a primary force player close, closer and tighter to the football, whereas he might be outrun by the tailback if they run to the perimeter on a quick toss. Okay. But a good way to solve that is just move this bandit out. We can talk about that a little bit. But I just want to show you guys the umbrella principle, the underlying principles, the run fits do not change. Okay, so like I said it before, how do we create multiple fronts? We do this a couple different ways. Obviously, you can use different personnel packages, and we have done that at Dover. And Coach Johnson, when I worked for him, he did that all the time. Me, I like to leave my same personnel on the field and run multiple fronts that way. And we found a way to do that using our words and numbers that keeps our personnel, our same personnel on the field, okay? We also do a third way, and everyone does this, slant, we stunt, we blitz. We, we haven't stemmed, but you could stem. That works too. Bottom line is no matter what we do with all this, our run fits, they never change. So if I were to use different personnel packages, our base is the 4-4-4-2-5. I like to use uh, money. Um, Coach Johnson, <laughs> he, he did the 4-3. He put in what he called nickel. Will Linebacker comes out. He puts in another DB, nickel safety in there. Um, <clears throat> I never did this at Dover. That's just a lot to me. But, you know, Coach Johnson did it. He had a lot of success with it at Montclair. He had a lot of success with it at Passaic Valley when he coached there. Uh, he's a wizard at doing it. The, the, the kids had a lot of success doing it. To me, I, I think if you're switching uh, to a 4-3 look, you're asking your middle linebacker now to be two-gapped. You know what I'm saying? So that's extra teaching and more on his plate. I don't want that with my kids, you know. So we don't really run in sense. I've never ran or called a, a nickel package for a 4-3 front. Um, I have done dime, which is 3-4. That means we take our defensive tackle out. We slide our nose tackle, nose tackle. And we put in an extra DB or our dime safety. So we become the 3-4 defense. I really have only ever done this against a couple of spread teams. Uh, Smyrna, one year we did it against. Um, and, you know, in, in last-minute situations when we're playing sticks coverage, we'll put in a dime 3-4. We took our big, big D lineman out and just got more speed in there. Uh, if I want to put in uh, other personnel in our 3-3-5 package, I'll just call money. That means our defensive tackle comes out and our uh, another DB comes in money safety. I've never done that. But I just want to show you guys this because there are ways to, you know, use different personnel and be multiple at the same time. And, and these are different personnel packages that I have at my disposal if I ever need to do that. So these are the numbers and the words that I want to go over. And I'll explain what the numbers mean in a minute. But out of our base front, we have a 31 front, a 13 front, an 11 front, 33, 22. We tag it with a word called wildcat, and we can run 11, 33, 22. That's our 6-2 look. We have our traditional overlook, our under front, and I have a special hash front called feel strong slash wild, or, or feel wild, and I'll explain that a little bit. These are our odd fronts that we ever do. I like to do 3-5-3. Three, three and have the, the guys head up to start with. And, and, you know, if I'm in an odd front with me, especially at 335, man, I'm fluid. I'm not static. I'm always moving, whether I'm stunting, slanting, blitzing. You know, we haven't stemmed much, but I'm just always moving. I'm creating new fronts from that stack front, okay? When the stack or the 335 first became popular, I saw it back in uh, 2008, 2009. You know, I saw certain coaches up in Jersey not blitz out of it. 
they just, you know, had their three down linemen and that was it. They weren't even in a 5-3 look. They had their outside backers off the ball. This is when the 5-3 first, or the 3-5 rather, first came into, you know, kind of being popular that was kind of introduced to, to the football world. Um, but, man, I saw this team run that, and they got gashed all day long. Uh, the opponent ran a lot of power and counter out of it, you, you know. And to me, so obviously, it, you know, uh, it's a, I guess you could say a spread defense, but you can make it a defensive front that, um, you know, really would work against a power team that runs pro I or, or wing T, what have you. You know, it, it's just, to me, you got to be fluid out of it. Um, that defense was built not to just sit there and play ball control. You gotta, you gotta attack. Um, we could, you know, our wildcats are a tag word, which tells the outside linebackers to come up on a line of scrimmage and play. Um, and so in this case, a five, three look, cause it's a stack call. So it's a four, zero, four technique. <clears throat> our Titan call, uh, was that tight front that everyone runs these days that really stops those spread inside zone teams, uh, we have two four-eye techniques and a zero technique. It's just down the B-gaps. We have a, our bear front, which is 3, zero, three. Um, To get into a true bear front versus a two-running back team or a three-running back team or a double tight team, we'll give it a, a stud call, and we'll have uh, one of our linebackers from the stack come down and play that seven technique uh, on the tight end. <clears throat> um, I, I haven't really run Oki a lot, which is a 3-4, four, four, zero, four. Um, if I'm going to show a 3-4 look, I'll just do it from stack, and I'll show you guys in a little bit uh, by sliding my linebackers. But I have, like I said, used our dime personnel to run a 3-4, but I haven't never really set, just kept our, you know, our 4-4 four, four personnel on the field and called Oki. Never done that before. But you could definitely, there's a way to do it. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, I don't want to bombard our kids with a million different things to do. Um, you know, we have our, our main fronts that we, we, we run – that week, and, and I don't like to go past three, to be honest with you. And one of them, I think, is always going to be the stack front because then, you know, when you stunt and blitz, you create new fronts. And that's what kids love to do. They love to, you know, get aggressive. So the system, what do these numbers mean here? <clears throat> the first number applies to the defensive tackle. The second number applies to the nose tackle. That's the techniques they're going to line up in. So if I call 31, D tackle is going to line up in three techniques. But those tackles gonna line up in a one tick. Okay. If I call 13, those tackle is in a one. I'm sorry, the D tackles in a one technique, those tackles in a three tick. If I call 11, both of them are one techniques. That's, by the way, inside share the guard for me. Um, if I call 33, both are in three techniques. If I call 22, both are in two techniques head up, and which means we're usually stunt or slam. Those two guys, anyway. Okay. Um, like I said, Wildcat, 11, 33. Uh, 22 wildcats just our call so like you know if we call 11 both of our tackles are in inside shade of the guard and one techniques and we call wildcat that means our bend and rover are down on a line of scrimmage it's six two look uh you know i believe it's called that split six or, or or that that stack six whatever they called it way back in the day um it's a real good front to stop the trap as i'll explain later you know it's the same thing if it's a three three it's that split six look the two defensive tackles are in three techniques and we give it a wildcat call Tells our band and rover you're on the line of scrimmage in a 6 2 look. Okay. Um, if we want to run the under front or over front, the over front just like 31. Okay. Except our our um, our nose tackle is now shaded on the center. He's not in the one technique inside the shade of the guard. Under fronts, the under front, I'll talk about that a little bit, and I'm gonna get to my hash fronts. But these are the numbers. So the, the, the if you see numbers from our base four forward, the first number applies to the D tackle. The second number applies to the nose tackle. The strike defensive end will always be in a seven technique, unless he's told otherwise. Sometimes versus a wing T team, we put him up head up on a six technique because we like to play knock him back with that tight end. We want to keep that tight end off our linebackers. And you T guys will know that. You know, we don't you want that tight end to go down, gap down, backer, right? Get to that backer. So we'll just play knock him back. Um, but then again, we like him in seven techniques because that shuts down the down play from the wing T. Okay, you can't run down uh, if you have your, your defensive end there uh, in a seven technique. Our weak side defensive end is always in a five technique. And our Mike and Will, some people like, you know, I know Coach Daniel <clears throat> will line up in the 30s. I, I like the Mike and Will to fit off their tandem. So really the Mike's always paired with the D tackle. The Will's always paired with uh, the nose tackle. Uh, the band is always paired with the strike. 
The Rovers always paired, uh, paired with the, the weak defensive end. Um, the Michael lineup opposite the three technique, or, or in, in 31, he will. If, if the defensive tackles in the one technique, he'll line up in the 30 technique. But if the D tackles in the three technique, he'll be in the 10 technique. Will, in turn, will be opposite of the nose. So whatever the nose is in, he's opposite. In this case, you know, uh, if the nose is in a one technique, Will's in a 30. Okay, so that, that's basically what the numbers mean. It's a real easy system. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to get out of this PowerPoint. I want to show you guys the fronts. Remember, I told you guys before, I had no way to copy and paste these, these you know, cool fronts into, into um, my PowerPoint presentation. Or else I, I haven't discovered how to do that just yet. So I'm just going to read off my notes here and just show you guys the diagrams. I'm going to read off the PowerPoint. Um, because our 31 front is our base front. You should probably be over here a little bit more. But as you can see, your tandems are fit off of each other. So this is a – it disrupts the guards, basically. This is great against um, zone schemes, okay? Or if a team likes to run into the B-gap on a weak side ISO, that's why we have this kit, cat right here on the side of the guard. It's disrupting the guards, okay? This is our base front. We play this nine times out of ten. The strength of the front is to the, to the defensive left, our right in this case, okay, because the three technique is on that side. Let me go back and show you guys our 13 front. It's just the opposite of 31, okay? And, and Coach, our no, yes, sir. I, I meant to make, I meant to, you know, make this comment when you were showing that slide earlier. I, I've coached with a few coaches now that – that use that numbering play call system for their interior defensive linemen. Um, oh no way! And it's and it's and it's grown on me because I, I you know I've had I've coached with two guys that have done it. I, it's grown on me because I really like the uh, flexibility that it offers in a play call to put your guys, you know, wherever they want. Just saying eleven, whatever double digit number you're going to say. Um, you know, you want them to to both play head up. You're going to say twenty two or, or whatever you want them to. to to be in a one and a three, you're going to say 13, whatever it may be. I really like the flexibility and obviously you can see it here in the illustration. So it's, it's definitely big time. Man. You want to use multiple fronts for sure. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, the underlying principles don't change coach. I mean, everything, the run fits stay the same, but you're screwing around with the O line block rules now. Absolutely. Now, could you imagine like, you know, you want to talk about stemming, you know, I mean, uh, I've called, you know, before when I was, JV defense coordinator up in New Jersey. I got these kids stemming from 31 to 13. And we would just say, hey, the call was 31, move to 13. The kids knew how to do it right away. You see these four move right before the snap. These guys up here should have bricked, part of my language. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't, right? There's no greater way to screw things up than by screwing around with high school offensive linemen blocking assignments. If you make them hesitant, okay, they're not sure what they're doing. You're going to have a good night as defense. They're not. Okay? Definitely. Unless they're on top of your game or on top of their game. You know, different story. I might tip my hat to them. But, uh, you know, just go, going back 13 front, man, this is the opposite of 31. The strength now is to uh, the weak side. So, I would call this front here <clears throat> the ball. Man, I don't want to. There was a way I found to kind of move all this over to the hash. I'm not going to screw around with that right now, but, you know, if the ball is on the hash, and I'll show you guys a little bit, I would call this front if a team showed a tendency to be 50-50, okay, because what you're doing here is, you know, you got your stronger personnel to the field, but the strength of the front is to this side, okay? So, you know, if a team kind of maybe showed a tendency – not even on the hash, but if they just showed a tendency right here to run to the to the weak side, I just call 13 front, all right, especially if they're 50-50, because now I set my defensive front, the strength of the defensive front, to that side, but I have my stronger personnel on the weak side of the front, all right, does that make sense? Coach, am I good on that? Absolutely. All right. That's the beauty of this system. It just plays to, to how flexible it is. Here's 11 Wildcat. So our two ones, our two deep tackles are inside Shea, the guard that runs the Wildcat call. Um, 
just tells our band and road we're moving a 6-2 look. Okay, they'll be in a two-point stance. Don't ask me how I came up with the name Wildcat. I think I was reading something once. In Kansas State, is it? Okay, yeah, because Kansas is Jayhawks. Kansas State Wildcats. And just I just said Wildcat. Bottom line is the kids loved it. They picked it up. That's all I care about. Okay? And, and that's important, too, having the kids understand your, your terminology, your communication. That's very important. 33. So, oh, let me go back to, to 11 real quick. Sorry about that. I got some more information on that. Um, this is great against the trap. It eliminates the trap play. Okay, it eliminates midline play because obviously you can't run that against one technique. I with the, with the QB sneak. Um, this could make pulling difficult too because of this cat guards. That's another reason why I like to have my one techniques on the inside shade of the guards. Um, like I said, if you face a heavy option team, line up in this front, you know they can't run midline. They're running either veer or speed option, okay? And this strike or this weak defensive end will be the option guy. Sometimes even as well, you know, the band would be that too if you're running triple, okay? Um, I like to run this as well against two tight informations from our quote-unquote full four look. Okay, 33. Sorry, I was getting a little ahead of myself before, but um, I don't ever really call Wildcat out of this because usually when you see this front, it's a passing down. And this is, I believe it's called the hot front in the NFL. Um, but uh, you have your defensive tackles and two threes and, and your weak D end and a five. And, and if there's a tight end here, your strike is in a seven technique still, okay, or in a six, depending on what your, your uh, game plan is for that week's opponent. Um, if there is no tight end, he's just in a five. And from this, we'll actually create a new front. Uh, you know, I don't think I put this in my PowerPoint. I have to give away all my secrets. But uh, a bingo call tells our Mike and Will their blitz are inside linebackers. No matter who they are, they're always blitz. Okay? So they'll creep up, and they'll create a freaking six-man line here versus either um, uh, six or five. There's no tight end. And we have them, you know, X stunting and crossing. And, the, and this D tackles crossing face. And this guy's coming here. It's crazy. We have them creeping up and dropping back and bluffing, you know. We have them creeping up or not creeping up at all and just blitzing, have a D lineman dropping back and playing zone. Uh, um, it's just a great way to create a, a very multiple front. This, guarantee, this front here guarantees one-on-one -on -one blocks for all your linemen and big-on-big -big protections. And like I said, it's a great front to stump from, and it's used in passing situations primarily or against spread teams. Okay. Hey, Talk about another front. That's coach, a great stunt question for you. Go ahead, coach. Uh, sure, go ahead. I have a question for you. So, um, do they creep on their own, or do you have a call for those situations? Generally, we like tell them to creep on their own. They have fun with it, um, but we'll tell them in practice too. You know, like we started creeping early one year all the time, and we had to tell the kids, "Dude, you can't creep anymore because you got to disguise your blitz now." You know. So we'll just tell them as the season went on, we just told them, don't creep. Just stay at four or five yards deep, whatever you are, and just blitz at the snap. So do you prefer – and this is my question here. That was a great, mm -hmm. that was a great question by Coach. Um, Absolutely. But, I, but I, uh, I have a question. Do you prefer blitzing? Do you prefer stunning from depth? Or do you prefer the creeping? Because to me – and, and I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I'm more of an offensive guy. But to me, as a and as a wing T guy, I, I like I like to see the creep if you're coming right there because I, that tells us going back to the rules. You know where I'm going to go. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Um, yeah, you're you're right on that. When when I play a wing T team, barely will you ever see me blitz. You know, we'll we'll switch up our fronts. We'll do stemming. We'll do some some. Oh, I love the pinch against the wing D because I want to squeeze, and then eliminate those quick hitting. You know, plays that you guys do, because man, if we come up the field, we're we're screwed. We're screwed, and that's why I don't like the blitz. If we are going to blitz, it's going to be from depth versus the wing D. No doubt about that. And because they're run blitz, they're run blitz. Right. So if they see a guard pull, they got to react accordingly. You know. And I've seen a lot of teams that do that do have their linebackers creep that are very successful with it. So I was just curious. They do. I, I just, to me, the farther you play off the ball against the wing tee, I think the better off you are a little bit because you have to see things develop with the wing tee. It's, it's a, they try and make you wrong. It could you know? be an offensive system thing too. You know, maybe you're, absolutely you're, maybe you're facing the spread team and uh, a spread team and, and you don't, you don't mind the creep because you, 
you know, you blitz from depth against a team that is getting their quick game off in, in 1.8 seconds, you're never going to get there anyways. You right. Know? So I, I was just getting to that. Absolutely. I mean, like I said, you said it against the spread, you can creep all you want. You know, maybe later on in the year you don't want to creep as much as the sky as your blitzes. But uh, against Wing T, I'm blitzing from depth if I do blitz. Hope that helps, Coach. Um, 22. So our D tackles are head up. And like I said, from this front, you know, we're starting out of this because we're not really one gap right now. We're head up. So we don't quite know which gaps these guys are taking. So we're just going to play games with these guys. We'll do a lot of stunting. Um, you know, uh, a Toro call we had where both these guys were stunt to the defensive right. Nike was just stunt to the uh, defensive left. Not to cut you okay. off, you've got another question. This is, this is where we love it. Sure, go for it. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, so for zone blitzes, do you drop the edge or interior D line into coverage? Ooh, I've done both before. Um, not lately, though, um, but you could do both. Like I said, it all starts with your tandems. Your rover's always with your defensive end. Your will's always with your uh, nose tackle, your mics, your D tackle. Band is with your stripe. So uh, we, we had a call in before called Dakota. So I'll, I'll use our bingo call. Bingo call tells our, um, our inside linebackers to blitz. So we say bingo Dakota. That means they're blitzing and their tandem partner here. In this case, the D tackles are dropping back in plain zone. So uh, our outside blitzing calls was uh, a smash. Smash strong meaning the bandit. Smash weak is the rover. So we call, you know, smash strong Dakota. That tells the strike he's dropping back, taking the bandit spot, you know, maybe playing cover three probably because we don't uh, – I'm just briefly on coverages. I'm big on keeping it simple with the coverages. I run, like, very few coverages. I don't want to bar kids with coverages. That's when lone coverage has happened on Friday nights. So we're either cover three because we played our league. We're running football team now. All right. So we'll play cover three man or, or read coverage. And we have an adjustment of our cover three called cloud. But like I said, it's always three under three over cover three. So they're just trading spots. It's the uh, Dakota call. Yeah. And, and coach, I loved, you know, as you know, my situation last year, I was, I was calling both the last. Yes, sir. Last it's to the year, but, but. But, must have uh, many beers, man. Yeah, so to the point, I we were playing our last game of the year, and we were bringing our mic, and the uh, the team we were playing thought they were going to get away with, and I'm just going to pat myself on the back here because I was never a defensive guy, but, you know, this ended up working out. So, and to this question, we, we were stunning our mic, and we were playing, we were playing a four, we were playing a four three, and we, so my point is I like dropping the defensive end not really an interior defensive tackle in the, at the high school level, but definitely swapping out that defensive end because we brought our mic and what they thought they were going to get was swinging that back out. Right. We were, you know, alleviating our mic and we had that uh, defensive end taking the flat and, and, and made a play there. But um, that was a great question by coach and, and great. Answer. Absolutely. Again, like I have done it before later on in the season, you know, when teams, you know, kind of saw us one way and then we got to throw something new at them a little bit. I don't make a habit of doing that. Again, you know, we oh, played, yeah. we played in the handle open coach, right? Teams ran the football. So, you know, we put an emphasis on just being multiple pre-snap, you know, and just playing sound football. Okay. Going back. So that's our 22 look. Um, the 22 look great to disguise your intentions, by the way, it's very flexible. Over, okay, so we got our nose tackle shaded. Everything else is a, really a third 31 look, except for the nose tackle is now shaded in the center. Uh, I like to use this against the pro I teams with the, with the gap schemes or two back uh, offenses and weak T offenses. But really, it's the same, same uh, strengths as the 31 front. Um, so, to me, I love the under front a lot. And I love it against two running back teams. Um, I love it against the wing tee. And, and I love it for a couple of different reasons. First off, what we do with this front here, and we'll cheat the free safety over, over number two. Like I said before, our band is going to come up. Our rover's just going to play where he plays. Our inside linebackers will fit off the D tackles. 
Our D tackle will now shade the center. Our nose tackle will be in a three. DN will be in a five. Our strike will be in a five. Um, it's an excellent run-stopping foot. But before I talk about the strengths of the front, let me talk about these players' alignments first. And, one, and I'm kind of going to mold these two together. The, the real big thing I like about this front is, is the tandems that it creates. Um, you always have two adjacent outside players next to each other that kind of make it difficult for the offense to execute double reach blocks and run to the perimeter on outside plays. Also, any down kickout blocks could be swiftly defeated, okay, because of the tandems. So you can stop. It's good against power, counter, and lead plays. Um, there's only one weakness of this on this front, and that's right here. There's only one bubble. That's right here. And you have your stronger personnel, the Mike D tackle strike bandit aligned to that to the front's weakness. Okay. So you have the weak side personnel aligning to the weak side and the strong side personnel aligned to the front's uh, weakness. Um, and because of the tandems, we tell the D end and the bandit to take their inside foot and align them on their man's outside foot. The strike and the nose tackle will take their inside foot and split the difference of the right tackle and the left guard respectively, or vice versa, down the other side. Uh, the D tackle will shade the center, but he has to align his inside foot on the center's outside foot, okay? Or in this case, he'll take his inside foot, that'll be the right foot, and align it on the center's uh, right foot, okay? And they align this way, like the strike and, and the nose tackle kind of split the difference of their guys because they have people next to them on both sides. The D tackle has to take his inside foot and align it on the center's foot because he's next to the, to the bubble here, okay? And the band and the D end have no one next to them on one side, so they have to do the same thing as the D tackle. But I like this front because, like I said, it's an excellent one stop, uh, run-stopping front. It's only one gapped, okay? Um, it's great to use against the wing T because, like I said, you know, the double reach blocks make it hard uh, for teams to get the perimeter, but it's good against the down kick out blocks. Um, if you want to stop the down play versus the wing tee, you know, you put this kind of seven technique, that's no problem. This stops belly because this guy here is in a three technique, you know, to the weak side. Um, and obviously you got your D tackle here in, in, in a shade really as a one technique that, you know, kind of forces the wing tee or any other offense for that matter to make adjustments if they want to run trap. And now you have a long trap call or something. Okay. So like I said, I kind of have, you know, you got your, to me, this is a 50 front. It's just gapped. That's what I love about it. You could take this rover, drop him back to safety, play your read coverage. I like to keep him up here in the box, still play cover three or invert these guys, you know, and, you know, against the wing T and these safeties got to read him. So if this Delaware back goes this way, He's inverting down. He's coming back here. Um, if he's coming this way, he's staying down. He's staying deep middle. There's ways to run, you know. I think there's ability with your coverage to get nine guys in the box running this front, um, if done correctly. Okay. So that's the under front. What is very similar to the under front. This is a hash front and a half. Um, it's called feel strong. So to the field, if you have a team that really has a very high tendency of running to the field, um, you, you know, we'll place our stronger personnel to the field, although you could put them to the boundary. But we're going to run the strong front, which is a hash front. So our D tackle, we'll just say for, for you know, this presentation purpose, we're going to put our, our personnel strength to the field. We'll say field strong. <clears throat> our D tackle is in a four-eye technique. Our strike, it would be, uh, we have him in a two-point stance and a, a go-six technique, we would call that. Our nose tackle would be in a shade. Our deep uh, offensive end on the weak sides of the five. We put our rover, similar to how we just talked about on the under front, he would, you know, take his uh, inside foot and align it on the tight end's uh, outside foot as a nine technique, and he's playing flats. Usually the coverage you're going to play from this, I play, um, I call Zorro, quarters, quarters, halves. If you get a motion here, and you have now two L's receivers into the boundary, we'll check the cover three, okay? But, you know, look at the strength of the front. It's 
to the field. Our personnel for, uh, strength is to the field. You know, you're looking to stop a team that really runs a lot here to the field. If this tight end comes out here, for some reason, we got to, you know, maybe he's not a tight end, maybe he's an X, or maybe, you know, he's a Rob Lurinkowski or somebody. Like I said, we'll play quarters, quarters, halves. This guy just runs out with him. He's playing flats all, at all times, okay? I like this front because, like I said, it's a hash front, provides strength to the field, and you can do a lot of blitzing out of this. You talk about zone blitzing. We'll drop the strike back here to the deep middle. He'll loop around here as to contain the two DNs, Will. And now we'll play games with our three inside guys. Maybe the nose will loop around. The mic will creep down here and the little will come over here. I mean, there's, there's a lot of the, – the, the amount to disguise your intentions from this front is awesome, and, and it's really good to attack. Okay. Field wild is the opposite. If a team shows a tendency from the hash to run to the boundary – We'll, we'll still have our, our um, personnel strength to the field, but now we'll change the strength of the front to the tight end side, okay? So now everyone just goes opposite. The strike is, is now a five. The D tackle is in the shade. The nose tackle now becomes a four eye. The end is now in a six head up, okay? And he'll be responsible for that, that C gap. The rover will be D gap, and he'll be backed up off the football. We're still playing quarters, quarters, halves. If this dude wants to motion this way. Okay, now we're going to play cover three where everyone comes back over here, okay? <clears throat> and we're just playing football. But now we have our strength to the, to the boundary with that four-eye or three technique. Same thing. It's got the same gap, okay? But our stronger personnel is to the field in case the team does run to the field. Okay. Okay, let me go to the stack front. So say we get a team, you know, that likes to come out and pro I one play and, you know, spread the next play. We don't want to take our personnel off the field. We can't. We don't know what we're going to do. You know, we'll, ju we'll just call stack. And what I like to do, and you don't have to do this, but we'll take our strike in, who's quick, and we'll put him back at the stack middle linebacker spot. We will never ask him to, to, to uh, you know, scrape out here, make the play. He'll always be blitzing or something, either an A-gap or every now and then in a B-gap, but he's an A-gap to A-gap player. You don't have to put your strike defense in event out there. You can move your nose, or your D tackle to nose and put your nose back to your being if your nose is that wrestler type kid or your weak defensive end and shift everyone over. But just for the purpose of this presentation, how I always done it is you put the strike back there because it's easier to call blitzes for him. The D tackle will take his spot in line of scrimmage head up in a, in a four technique. Um, nose is a zero. Defensive end is in a weak four. Um, I like this because even though these guys are head up, they're always on the move, either slanting or stunting, okay, uh, or stemming. But I've never really done that from this. Um, so, it, and, you know, like I said before, our line principles don't change. They're still going to do one gap because they're always slanting or stunting. Um, this is a great front in disguise and create new fronts from, as I'll show you guys in a minute. If I do, if I, let's say a team comes out and they have uh, 20, they got 12 personnel, we'll give this a wildcat call. And now this becomes a 5-3 look. We did a lot of this last year at Dover. Uh, Coach, you know, Kirk Thomas, it's my man. Uh, he ran a defense the past couple of years. And last year, we actually found success with this. Two years prior, uh, run a five-three, um, and we kind of we had the person. We started out briefly in a four-four, um, but eventually we ended up long. So that is the stack front, and I'm going to show you guys before I get to the bear front. I'm going to show you guys some uh, stack stuff that I like to do. I mean, I think the opportunities or the amount of things you can do are kind of limitless from this front. So if I call stack slide left Sarah, the slide left tells my linebackers they are now sliding one man over to the left. Or I shouldn't say one man. Well, yeah, I'll say one man because they were stacked. So the will now, you know, he was behind the end, defensive end. Now he's over the guard. Okay. Uh, that strike middle linebacker is now over this guard here. The mic's coming down, acting like a defensive end. So 
if you want to maybe your dude right you want to get more involved on, on blitzing or, or stunting give them a slide call in the th from the stack our uh, Sarah call is slant right s for slant r for right I'll give you a left call We would call stack slide right Sally. Sally is our slant to the left. And again, this is all from a defensive perspective, by the way. Um, but we told our linebackers to slide to the right and they're slanting the apps. Okay. Again, the will is, we talked about personnel before, right, coach? The will was the speedier of the two linebackers. Sometimes you want him down as defensive end. A lot of NFL teams do it with, uh, um, you know, their jack players, I guess they call them, right? Um, you get him on the line of scrimmage, rushing the passer now, the slant call. Now, keep in mind that when he's called, when anyone's calling the slant, it's got to be a controlled rush. Unless we give it a certain call where it's a jet call, passing situations where we tell the guys, get to the quarterback any which way possible. But other than that, they're, they're slanting or blitzing, it's controlled. In other words, you're reading your guy in front of you, um, you know, Based off of what they're doing, it's how you act. So, I mean, if no one's pulling, then yeah. But this will still has contain. Can't let anything get outside of him. But he's slanting inside and causing, causing havoc in there. Um, notice, before I go any further, the underlying principles don't change. These are just spill guys still. We're just moving around. Now, what we have here, guys, is, is a 3-4 look from our stack front. That's why I've never called Oki before. There's no need to. We just go from stack and... We'll, we'll slide our linebackers and slant or blitz and create a three, four. Um, so without sliding our linebackers here, stack sour strike. So like I told you before, me, if I'm running three, five, I'm always moving my D lineman. I'm always bringing at least one linebacker because now you have a four, four look here when we're blitzing one linebacker. All right. That's what they're there for blitzing. So that strike is always going. He's acting like a D lineman anyway, but now I'm just putting him back at – he's always blitzing from depth. He could creep too. Um, but, you know, our strike call, if we give it a Sarah call, that means the strike is blitzing because we give it a strike call, and he's got to fit opposite of his tandem, which is the nose tackle. So if nose tackles go uh, slant to the right, my dude here has to, has to blitz opposite if, his, if strike is called, okay? Sally's strike is just the opposite. Okay, same thing. That's our four-man blitzes. And you can do it with any one of the other linebackers, too. It doesn't have to be the strike. Here's our five-man blitzes. Stack, Sarah, fire. So the fire call from the stack front, okay? If I call bingo, that means all these guys are blitzing, all three of these inside guys. But if I call fire, that means the strike and the mic. The two guys on the right, hence the fire, the R and the fire, are blitzing, and they're fitting opposite their tandem or the guy in front of them. If I call Sally smoke, smoke, when there's fire, there's smoke, right? So smoke would kind of be the opposite. Remember, you want to keep your terminology relatable, easy for the kids. Smoke tells a strike. And the guys on the, on the uh, defensive right, okay? I think I have that the wrong way. This should be fire. The other one should be smoke. Well, you get my point. He's blitzing opposite his tent, okay? We're really, when we're blitzing here, what we're creating, you know, and I'll go back to the, to the, uh, the, single, to, to the four-man blitz. When the strike's blitzing, you're creating an 11 front like this, Okay? the same thing just the ability of this stack front to create new fronts and you can disguise your extensions is just awesome just want to show you <clears throat> two more fronts here with blitzes if we pinch which do a lot do a lot of stack pinch fire i'm sorry you know i'm thinking one thing that annoys me about this system is i can't look at it from a defensive perspective this should be stack pinch smoke because these guys should be on the left, okay? But I call the fire, whatever. But just to show you the blitz, let me, uh, I want to show you guys 
the long call. So the long call tells our defensive tackle or defensive end in this case, whoever, you know, whatever you want to call them, you know, now you're coming, you're stunting long, so you're stunting um, two gaps over, okay? <clears throat> and because I gave it a uh, – what should be a smoke call, um, the mic is now the outside guy who contained, and the strike is taking the B gap. So just by using the terminology and this front alone, excuse me, you're creating overload blitzes now and overload fronts um, a little bit. You got three guys here coming off on the right, two guys coming off here on the left. And you're really, like I said, attacking those, uh, those B gaps in this case, on this side over here. So that's the stack front. I do want to show you guys bear. Bear's an awesome front. Uh, the way I like to call bear is very simple. Just take your bandit and rover. They're now on the line. You take traditional nose tackle spot. Keep your defensive tackle at the three technique. Your, your weak DN's now another three technique. Your rover's a two on the, you know, uh, a tight five, or I should say, yeah, probably a loose five. His, you know, inside leg is on the outside leg of the tackle. Your strikes in the seven technique. Uh, the bandit's taking his inside foot on the outside leg of the tight end. So it would kind of be maybe somewhat head up on that wing if he's playing a wing D team. This is an excellent run-stopping front, good against the wing D, good against two or three running back teams. Um, this is the only time where we ask our nose tackle maybe to just bull rush and be a two-gap player. But more so than not, you know, um, we might just stump this guy. And, you know, maybe blitz a Will or a Mike and just have th these guys go up. But this is probably the only time, again, to me, when you run the bare front, I think you really have to kind of really uh, commit to it. I don't commit to it. We're on a 4-4, but we use it as a package. And I think as a package, you can kind of break that one principle where and make your nose tackle just that, that two-gap player where you just tell them, hey, bull rush to dude. Don't pick a gap, just bull rush and knock them back a little bit. And obviously, you know, that's where, like, quickness to me would be premium. If this dude's quick off the ball, you know, he's going to beat that center. That center's got a lot to handle there. You know, what I like out of this, why do I like against the wing tee? Covers up all their blockers, okay, creating one-on-one -on -one situations. It's very hard for these guys now to get to the linebackers. Um, it's a great short yardage front. And like I said, my rule of thumb is if you're getting gashed on the run, you got to put more men on the line of scrimmage. And to me, that's the bare front. And then if they're still beating you with the bare front, then, you know, it's just not your night. You stink or whatever. You know, they're just kicking your butts, and that is what it is. But if I'm getting gashed out of my 4-4 and I need a problem solver front to stop the run, it's this front here, you know. And that's why, like I said, don't worry about the nose tackle being a two-gapper here as much because, you know, you want your best 11 on the field, nine times out of 10, this guy's going to be pretty much a dude anyway who gets off the ball. If you got an XYZ type kid, he'll be able to handle his own. But, you know, we'll call some stunts, you know, maybe slants or pinch where, you know, well, it's tough to do a pinch here with these two, three techniques. But, I mean, you guys get my point. Um, you know, uh, we'll do try and do a lot of slant and keep it one gap. But if we can't, we have no problems having just that one player there be two gap. It's an easy – easy transition um the last front i got and i'm almost done is the oaky front where i put it right here here we go so i would like to do this against spread teams uh you know especially a spread team that runs uh, 11 personnel you know if you want to keep your your strike as a regular defensive end we just you know move them one man over head up and a six technique on the tight end. Your D tackle is now on the four. Nose tackle is over the center. Um, weak defensive end is now on the four over the tackle on the left side. Or vice versa, he's on the other side. Like I said, we're always slanting and bringing somebody. We're still one gap even at this front. And, you know, if this dude was here and maybe this guy was out here, we could still do this and slant this way. And now, you know, they're running zone read. Here's the read. Okay. And, you know, 
this forces him now to, to keep the ball if he crashes hard and run it. Now you got two guys and this linebacker scraping over here. Um, that's kind of where maybe, you know, we would favor this front, putting the, the weak side, <clears throat> excuse me, defensive end, kind of that overhang, as you can call them, that, and that go six look to the running back side just to toy around with the read. Like I said, it's great against spread formations. I've never really – everything I've done was basically you just send me a stack just with different, you know, moving your personnel around. Let me go back to my PowerPoint real quick. So all this stuff here I just went over with you guys. So this is a pretty important slide. Um, when to call certain fronts. If the ball is in the middle – or let's start in the hash. If the ball's in the hash, if your opponent has a strong tendency to run to the field, run either field strong – Okay, or field 31. Easy there. In both your situations, you got your best personnel to the field aligned because it's a field call. And you're the front of both these, uh, the strengths of both these fronts to the field. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't worry about the, the boundary if the team never likes to run to the boundary. Don't worry about it until it becomes an issue. All right. Stop, stop their tendencies first. Um, your opponent has a strong tendency to run to the boundary. So, that's when oh, I did it again. Sorry. That's when I will run field wild, maybe. Okay. So you put your personnel strength, they're called to the field. But now the strength of the fronts, the back, or I would call bench 31. Okay. So now that should be 13. No, I'm sorry, bench 31. So now you got your personnel strength to the, to the boundary, and they're also, you know, the three techniques now to the boundary. So just both your personnel and front strength is to the boundary. This is where it gets a little dicey. If your opponent has a 50-50 tendency to run either side, run field 13. So now you've got your strong side personnel to the field, but the strength of your front is to the boundary. So the, those tackle will be at a three, D tackles in a one. Or run field under. So now you got your, once again, um, your strong side personnel, okay, is to the field. But now the strength of your front is to the boundary, okay? Same thing. Opponent has a tendency to run to the tight end, run tight 31. So you got the tight call tells your personnel to the strong side, the line up to the tight end. That's the strong side. No matter where the tight end is, okay? Get there. Run 31, that means your D tackles on the three, nose tackles on the one, or run tight under, okay? So have, you're going to have really your personnel strength and your, uh, your front strength to the tight end. And under front would probably be the opposite, okay? So you can kind of, you know, compensate if a team does run maybe a weak side ISO or, or belly or something to the weak side, run the tight end under. Ball in the middle of the field. Opponent has a strong tendency to run to the tight end, tight 31. Opponent has a 50-50 tendency. Run tight 13, tight under, or if there's no tight end run, whatever, you you know. I like to base off the quarterback's arm. So if the quarterback's righty, okay, you're giving a left call, 13. If he's lefty, you give it a right call. Run 13. Okay. Opponent has a strong tendency to run to the defensive left, left 31. Opponent has a strong tendency to run to the defensive right. right. So I just want to give you guys some, you know, when to call certain fronts right here. I, you know, I think this is a, a good sheet to have in your back pocket, maybe even on game night. I went over all this right here. Like I, like I said, our slide calls, linebackers slide over, Sarah, Sally, Sam, right and left, respectively. Uh, long call, defense end of the blitz side, sun's one gap over, and stack front. And, you know, fire and smoke and stack. Um, strike and mic blitz, smoke and strike and will blitz. Um, that should be the opposite. Fire should be when strike and mic blitz, and, and smoke should be strike and uh, mic. Strike is just obviously the strike blitzes. It's been a long day. Conclusion, finally. Just remember, I, I hope I helped you guys out tonight with something. Like I said, we've all done our research, done our homework. I'm no genius. I just 
wanted to present you guys with something simple for your kids that's multiple, flexible, it's easy, structured, and organized to understand. And just remember, like my motto when it comes to that, kiss, keep it simple, stupid, be structured, and organized, and just have your communication in place that's relatable to the kids and keep it short and sweet. Um, I did not put my email here, Drat. I'll have to put it in, but if you guys, you know, just shoot me a tweet if you want the PowerPoint. That's my Twitter. My Facebook is on here. I don't really conduct football business on Facebook other than, you know, all in, you know, go Coach G or Coach Q. And, you know, I like to root for all my guys. Uh, love coaching with the Delaware football coaches, man. We're like a fraternity. And, I, you know, if we're not playing each other, I'm pulling for you on Friday night. It's, you know, we're friends. and uh, It's, it's uh, what we pull for each other. So, but, you know, I mean, if just shoot me a message on uh, Facebook and I'll definitely get it to you. I also have a YouTube channel I'm about to start. It's called the All in Football channel. It looks like that. Um, I'll post this presentation on there, Coach, if that's okay with you. Oh, good. Um, good. You know, whenever I get it. Uh, I haven't quite figured out how to, how to kind of do that yet, but I will. Um, our other presentation, I'll get on there too when we get route conversions. Um, and that's it, man. Coach, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, uh, shoot them my way. Yeah, so guys, uh, I appreciate you guys for uh, – a lot of you guys stuck in for the long haul. We're going to be doing these on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Like I said, we just had one on uh, pass protection. That was really good um, two nights ago, very detailed. Tonight's was good. So Tuesday and Thursday nights, 7.30 Eastern time, man. We're going to be rocking these out. So, And I'll post the recordings on my YouTube channel as well. But that's Coach's information. You guys can certainly, if you're on the email chain, certainly send me an email at any point in time. But thanks for joining in, guys. Appreciate it, man. All right. I will see you at some point in time, Coach. I'm sure we will talk. Um, Absolutely. Uh, that was a great job, Coach. You did. You did awesome. Let me stop the recording.